Hello, I'm Oliver and this is Deep Cuts, a channel dedicated to music for lovers of music. So I really enjoyed doing the Vaporwave and Hauntology discussion video a few weeks back. We had some great discussions in the comments section. It was a really interesting thing to talk about and it led me to want to talk about other ways in which music informs and affects our everyday lives. Since we're all lovers of music here, it makes sense for us to delve into these ideas and theories because music is such a big part of our lives. And I'm definitely not just speaking for myself here. I've had many conversations with many of you over the past year of this channel's life. Today, I want to talk about the concept of using music as a coping strategy or coping mechanism. I doubt there is a single person watching who hasn't used music to get through a difficult time in their lives at some point, be that a breakup, the death of a loved one, exam or job stress, depression. As someone who listens to music all day, every day, I take immense comfort in certain albums, certain artists, certain songs, and I often find myself returning to these same songs and records at times when I need a pick-me-up, or maybe at times when I feel like I just want to wallow. The records in the thumbnail, for example, are records that I find myself curling up inside of when I'm feeling down, or I'm finding a particular thing difficult in my life. So the bleak melancholy of Springsteen's Nebraska, the lullaby tones of Beach House's Teen Dream, the resonant hang drums and sax melodies in Portico Quartet's Isla, and of course those um, splintered, dense piano and synth expressions on John Hopkins' Immunity. These are the sounds that I personally return to and I'm very aware that it's different for everybody. My comfort record might be your worst nightmare and vice versa. So what is it about music that has us returning to it as a coping strategy? Anything that can be classed as a coping strategy relates back to stress, right? So when we're stressed, we try and find ways to cope. The reason music works so well at alleviating stress is because it's one of the quickest forms of catharsis. And by catharsis, I mean the process of releasing and thereby providing relief from strong or repressed emotions. Some studies were done a few years back at McGill University in Montreal, and they proved an inexplicable link between people listening to their favorite pieces of music and a release of endorphins in their system. You know that chill that some pieces of music just always give you? You know, you feel that chill going all the way through your body. Well, that's a release of endorphins. That's the body connecting with music on a level that we still don't particularly understand as much as we would like to, but what we do know is that it taps into our deepest reward systems. The paper described it as an abstract reward, which is actually an oddly poetic way of looking at the way human emotion attaches itself to music. So this itself proves our deep connection to music as humans. And if listening to our favorite tracks can release endorphins and make us feel good, then it's no real leap of logic to consider why we find listening to sad music a cathartic experience, a way of expunging those feelings from ourselves. Sometimes it might take some Oscar Peterson to relieve the stresses of the day for me, or a good old sing-along to some Dillinger escape plan if I'm really feeling pent up and pissed off. Except I know from experience that just because something feels cathartic, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's actually cleansing you of those feelings. So I'll give you quite a personal example. I went through a breakup this year and whilst I was coming to to terms with the change, I found myself returning again and again to Sun Kill Moon's Benji, a personal favourite record of mine anyway. While that record isn't specifically about breakups, it acutely details relationships in such a personal way that it made me feel closer to my own pain that I was feeling. It made me feel like it was okay to think about those small details and the little things that you miss. Which of course it was an okay thing to do and it's healthy to mourn if that word doesn't sound too over the top in the context that I'm talking about. But I realized after a while that I was returning to this record so often and reliving that pain that I wasn't really allowing myself to heal. The resolute sadness of Kozilek's lyricism on tracks like Carissa and I watched the film The Song Remains the Same was in a way holding my emotions in a state of flux. I was wallowing to the point where I was letting the music dictate my mood and all of a sudden I reached a time where I could be completely fine but you play me the first six notes of a track like Carissa and <laughs> I would just be a complete mess. Another really interesting study which was conducted by PhD student Emma Carl in 2015, attempted to reveal this idea that we've just been talking about of music as a coping strategy actually negatively affecting our mental health. And her study brings up some interesting ideas. Firstly, she identified three different coping strategies with regards to music. Diversion, so distracting yourself from a bad mood. So the individual isn't trying to mirror the music with their own mood, rather they're papering over it and trying to ignore it. So, you know, you're feeling sad, 
you listen to a happy song. Solace, so this is finding comfort in music, finding music that matches your emotional state. Perhaps this is the one that comes up most commonly for me, certainly the music that I mentioned in the thumbnails, those albums I mentioned earlier. If I was to consider those as a coping strategy, they would probably come under the banner of Solace more than these other two. Discharge, this way is matching the emotional state of the music to your own emotional state. However, this time you're using the music to express the emotions in an even more intense way. So for example, I might come in and be pissed off and put some Converge on because the intensity of the emotion in that music somehow helps me feel those emotions in an even more intense way. Whilst Carlson's study didn't particularly produce a conclusive set of results, they did reveal that certain subjects, primarily men, using the discharge method of coping strategy had greater levels of anxiety and they were exhibiting heightened neurotic behaviour. Whilst yes, this isn't a conclusive study, I think it's really interesting seeing ways in which music could affect our mental health in ways that we hadn't considered before, especially if we feel like we're healing ourselves with said music. All those categories Carlson referred to are quite illuminating ways at looking at coping strategies within our own music listening habits. Which leads me to discussion time, my favourite bit. <laughs> so what do you think about this idea of music as a coping strategy? Is it a healer or potential detriment or both? Do you find that your music listening coping strategies fit squarely into one of those categories of diversion, solace or discharge or do you find that it can completely depend on your mood or your state of mind? Have you had any times in your life where a specific artist or album has gotten you through the pain and out the other side? And if that's the case, what is it specifically about that music that helps facilitate this? Or is that too abstract a concept to quite work out? Can we even work out what it is about some artists that makes us feel better? Really interested to hear your thoughts on this one. I look forward to chatting with you all and discussing this topic. I'll be back next week with another video. See you then.